Um, all right. So where I'm starting from in terms of my developer environment that I'm going off of today is one that's already been set up. Um, I, for the most part, just followed directly the getting started guide that is in the readme of the modulus repository. Um, and so what that essentially means is I've checked out the repositories, installed their dependencies, set up a MySQL database, um, which is where the, the module metadata is actually stored, and have configured it to work with an ID system so that I can log in. Um, I'm working on updating the documentation, hopefully by the end of this week, to make it a little bit easier to follow. But there's already kind of a step-by-step -step how to get started with a dev environment. So where I'm starting is basically fresh off of there. Um, so this is Modulus running on my local machine. And, and just to there's check, a few. Yeah. So just, just to check, is the last time someone was trying to go through this, I remember they complained about particularly the ID step being able mm -hmm. to uh, connect to an ID server or something. Is that that has has that been updated at all yet, or is it still the same? You need to either be running your own OpenMRS ID system or connect to the real one. Yeah, that's still the case, and that I think is the biggest the biggest barrier to getting started. Um, so that's something that I'd like to work on again, probably by the end of this week. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, so so OpenMRS ID is used for logging in to Modulus. And so it's using the same ID that we use in the community, which is really convenient in production. Uh, the problem is, is that when I wrote it, it's a little bit too tightly coupled to that OAuth process. And so there's no way to sign in without talking to an ID server. Um, so like, I'll demo it right now. When I'm hitting sign in with OpenMRS ID, you're actually hitting a page that's running on a production ID server, and it's an OAuth handshake, and then Basically, a user signs in, approves that they want to log in, and then they're logged in. Um, what I would like to do is, when Modulus is in like a developer environment, have an alternative where you can hit login, and it will show you a screen with just a few different profiles, like a couple of users and an administrator. And you can select one, and it will kind of fake the OAuth handshake to make that work. Um, and then the ID requirement is completely gone. Um, what you can do now if you want to get started is you don't need to run your own ID server. You just need a um, API token from the production ID server. I believe in the guide there is a link to like a Google form to request one. That pretty much sends an email to me and a couple other people on the infrastructure team. And then we would create an ID token and send it to you over email. Um, so it's possible to do it without an ID server, but it requires a little bit of like intervention of people on the infrastructure team. Thanks for asking that, Darius. OK, um, so let me get into talking about the structure of the platform. It basically, so, so Modulus is split into two different applications, which are actually in separate repositories altogether. There's the core, which is the data model, stores metadata about modules, and maintains where they're actually uploaded. Um, and then there's the UI, which is an AngularJS application that presents the user interface to it. Um, so I kind of drilled down here, what are the two differences between the platforms? And let me see if I can make that font a little bit bigger. Great. Um, but the core is an application written in Grails, so it's groovy. Uh, Grails is, a, if you've not used it before, it's a web application framework similar to Rails, um, but it sits on top of Spring. It's um, groovy, so it's Java with a lot more <laughs> dynamic qualities to it. Um, and it's an MVC style application. So there are modules. Uh, Grails has a pretty automatic ORM that maps those to a SQL-backed database. Um, and then, in our case, there are controllers that basically publish REST resources. The UI, like I said, is written in Angular. Um, a lot of the UI elements come off of Bootstrap, which is a CSS and UI framework. Um, and it's 
there it's there's a build process for the UI and it's facilitated by Grunt, which is a Node.js application. But what the UI does is it communicates with a core server and it allows users to actually interact with the module repository. And the UI is what's actually being served at modules.openmrs.org. Um, to give you a basic idea, the things, if you're making changes to core, you're doing things like touching the data model, changing the kind of data that's represented on each module, uh, changing the way searches work, or exposing new API resources. Um, there's a, another piece that's kind of a service within the core, which is a parser for OMOD files. And so we actually pull metadata out of the config.xml of OMODs when they're uploaded to make the metadata more consistent that we get on every module. In the UI, things that are being changed are obviously UI and visual content. Um, and then basically, you're adding any kind of user interaction that works with the API that's already being exposed by the core layer. So the entire interaction between the UI and the data model is through this REST API. Uh, part of the reason why we did that a couple years ago was to make it easy to write other clients that interact with the same module repository data. Uh, however, as far as I know, there hasn't been a lot of work on something like that. But I know there were originally plans to do something like write a command line utility that interacted with the same data, and that would be theoretically possible. Um, it, should, it wouldn't be too hard to do once you had the uh, authentication component done. Um, but anyway, that's a basic overview. Are there any questions on that before I kind of move forward? OK. Um, so let me jump in to the, the uh, I'm, I'm in the core repository right now. And I'll just kind of walk you through a little bit of what the code looks like. Um, this is just a tree of the repository. And so each of these is a directory, um, and then the files within that directory. And I, this is just kind of to give you a brief overview of how things are laid out. Um, so there's a directory called Grails app that's at the root. Grails app is where the Grails code lives. And since this application is Grails plus a couple services, almost everything is sitting within this directory. Um, the key things are the controllers. So these are classes that facilitate interaction with the data model and the REST API. Um, each one of those roughly corresponds to an action that may be taken on a specific type of object. So things like the module controller, um, it contains methods for all the basic CRUD operations on a module, creating modules, reading them and presenting them, uh, updating them and deleting them. Um, same thing with release. Release has some additional methods in it because release supports um, uploads. And it's actually facilitated with this RESTful upload controller because we have a generic class to be able to do uploads of files to the data model. Um, in the domain directory, you have objects that are corresponding. They define the ORM mappings for our data model. So basically, how to go from rows in the table to serialized objects that we can interact with. Um, and the, the domains the, the domain classes are all kind of automatically synced with the table. Um, and you can see some of that in the migrations directory. Anytime we make a change to the data model, and I'll show you a little bit more about this in a little bit, um, we generate a change log, and then it goes into this migrations directory. So you can see these different migrations, a lot of them correspond with mod numbers, which are ticket numbers in our JIRA project. And each one of those contains a brief description of how to change the database to update it to the new data model so that when we deploy this in different locations, we can apply the change log and roll forward. Um, and that's something that is, there's a, there's a plugin for Grails that generates them, but it is a manual step in the process of making a change to the data model. Um, then the last thing is the service directory, which contains services that are called from controllers. So a lot of these have, are um, functionality that doesn't directly correspond to an API call, but one or more API calls use these services. Um, so one of the key, or kind of the key two that you see in a few different places are the search service, which is what searches 
the data model and is used to do things like the big search bar at the top of uh, the module repository and the OMOD parser service, which is called when modules are uploaded and they're config.xml. Um, I'll do a similar thing in the UI, which I think I didn't run this tree command, but let me ignore the lib so that you don't see a bunch of dependencies. Okay. Here we go. Um, in the, the UI application, which again is just a front end application, some JavaScript, HTML, and it's all being run by Angular. Um, what you have kind of the most important things to pay attention to are these JS files. Um, each of these is a service or a controller in Angular, and they're all loaded in index.html, which is what's actually served when someone browses to modules.fms.org. Um, they all pull from partial templates, which are located in this partials directory. And so these are all HTML templates that Angular um, uses to present the UI. Um, and then less is the preprocessed CSS language. Um, if you're familiar with SAS, it's very, very similar. Uh, it's just what Bootstrap is written in. And so that's why we chose to adopt it, since we use a lot of Bootstrap elements. Um, so that's a brief overview of just how the code looks. Any questions about that before I start diving into them? Okay, cool. Um, so I, what I would like to do is to just kind of walk through what a typical change that uh, touches both the core and the UI would look like. Um, so the the example that I'm going to do for that is changing or adding a property to our modules that is um, recognizing the awareness of modules property. So if you aren't familiar, um, let me see if I can jump over to this in the wiki. Yeah. Um, one of the properties of a module is awareness of other modules. Um, that's similar, it's kind of similar to a dependency, except that it, if I understand it correctly, allows modules to access um, code and interfaces of other modules if that module is installed, but it's not, a, it's not a strict dependency. The module can still start if that, isn't, that other module isn't available. Um, so it's used to add extra functionality to a module if another one is installed so that they can work together. Um, and then this is facilitated by this list in the config.xml of each module. So there's a block with an aware of modules tag and then module IDs that are added in there. Um, the reason I'm not doing the dependency requirements is because that was actually change that was done by a Google Coden student um, last year. And I'm not sure, I don't think that change has made it into production yet, but we do have code that recognizes dependencies and then uh, shows them on the page, on the UI page. So when you go to look at a module, you can see what other modules it needs to be able to start if it has any. But I'm gonna add a similar thing for uh, aware of module entries. <clears throat> so, let's see. To be able to do this, um, I'll just go over like the kind of changes that you need to make to be able to start showing modules here. Um, oh, and before I do that, actually, yeah, this is what it would look like. Um, so there's this required modules field in the UI view for showing a module. Um, this is just called the show module view. And this one doesn't appear to have any required dependencies, so it's a bad example. But basically, modules that are listed as dependencies appear just in the list here with their names comma separated. And what we're gonna be doing is adding a similar field 
but instead of required modules, it's um, mod it's aware of modules or mod like optional modules. Um, the changes that need to be make made to do something like that is we need to make a small change to the data model because we need to start storing um, we need to start storing that association of modules that a particular module is aware of. So that's going to be um, a new table in our database. We need to update the config.xml parser so that we can read, so that we can serialize those aware of module tags in a modules config file. Um, then in our uploading controller, we're going to need to be able to, to um, basically use the new information from the parser to update the data model. And then lastly, we're going to need to perform a database migration so that in the actual MySQL database that backs this, we get those new tables added in those new columns as necessary. So those are an overview of the core changes. Um, in the UI, it's actually pretty simple. These changes are going to update the REST API that the UI is receiving. And so all that we need to do is add the row below this one that uh, that will basically add a line to the template that renders um, the aware of modules. We'll be doing that in this page, which is the show module page, and then also in the upload page, similar to here, they'll be like, we'll add another box that says aware of modules so that as a user is uploading a module, they can see that those dependencies have been recognized. Okay, so let me dive into that. Um, I did a little bit of work ahead of times and <laughs> wrote out the changes for these things. Um, and so I'll start kind of replaying them and walking through what these different files look like in the code. So I'm gonna start by making the changes to core. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the OMOD parser since that's just kind of a standalone service. Um, that's OMOD parser service .groovy, and this is what it looks like here. Um, there are essentially two methods in here. Get metadata, which is given a OMOD file once we've verified that it exists, um, and calls this git config XML method. This one actually opens it up as a jar and returns like a, an XML parse stream of the config.xml file. And then get metadata parses through that stream, grabs information that's pertinent, and then returns a dictionary with all of these properties that gets handed back to the upload controller. So what we need to add in here is, you can see here there's kind of a for loop through the required modules that's building a list of the module IDs that are required. Um, we just need to do something similar with the aware of modules. So, Um, is the application there of that code snippet that modulus stores modules by just just an ID by just yeah, the short there's... ID, not the full like, fully qualified one? Yeah, um, that's something that in retrospect I might have done it a little bit differently. But essentially, the the unique IDs in Modulus are just a number that's assigned just an incrementing number. And so that's the ID that Modulus actually uses. Um, but it keeps track of the ID of the module and you're, it's not fully qualified. Um, that was probably, that decision was just based on, my guess is some misunderstanding of the way that module IDs work. Um, but the important thing is that you can look up a module by its ID. Um, and so in this case, what the, the student who did the dependency parsing actually did is just stored those module IDs as text as dependencies. And then in the UI, uh, just displayed those dependencies by name. And I think he actually, he wrote some code that would basically load that module. It would get, so the UI would get a string that the module, this module is dependent on, you know, form entry. Form entry would just be a string and then he would manually create that link to form entry. Um, so the, the REST API wasn't actually aware of the, the relationship between the two objects. It was just containing a bunch of strings. Um, and so to keep things simple, that's what I'm going to do now. Um, for production, it might make more sense if it's not too complicated to re relate the actual modules together. 
um, because then you would be able to really quickly get at the other objects and you wouldn't have to be performing a lookup or a search. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I'm going to start adding this. Uh, basically, there's going to be a for loop here, which is going to be very, very similar to the previous loop. And let me strip out the pluses. Um, what it's going to do is look at the aware of module entries in a config.xml file and then add them to an array here. So I will also define the array above, very similar to the required modules array. Um, then the only other thing to add is this aware of modules property if, uh, in the dictionary that gets returned from the parser. At the start there, um, I'm going to jump over to the release controller and show you what that looks like. So the release controller uh, sits on top of the controller, a kind of a, a meta controller that facilitates uploads. So when, a, when, and when the API sends a file that's like, this file needs to be uploaded, the RESTful upload controller is what gets a space on disk to store it and does the actual file transfer, um, then hands things over to the release controller, which is what is responsible for making that relationship between an uploaded file and a release object, and then the release object and the module that contains it. So every module contains uh, zero or more releases, and each release corresponds with a version number of that module and a file for it. Um, so this overridden method called do upload is the one that actually, it, it calls the um, upload controller to do an upload based on a new file that's been sent to the API, and then after it calls that super method, it, it updates the metadata on the actual release. So you can see here, there's a call to the OMOD parser service. So we were just looking at calling the get metadata method um, with the new path of the release. And then from that meta, which is a dictionary, which is um, this dictionary that we just saw, it will, um, it will, update properties on the module data, uh, the data model, so the domain object. So what we'll need to add here is another line that updates the aware of modules property on that domain object and can pull from the dictionary that the OMOD parser returns. Um, before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and make changes to the data model itself, since right now adding another property here would just be an error because that's not a parameter on the data model. So this here is module.groovy in the out models of directory. Yes. Uh, out of curiosity, are there tests? Uh, or is there a test suite that if we were to be doing this, we could be following TDD? There's, um, there's not right now, and for the most part. There, that would probably be a really good thing to do, especially as we encourage more people to work on this. Um, there's a little bit on the front end test suite of kind of services in the front end, um, but on the back end, there's not a whole lot. I think, if I remember correctly, there are some tests that are written for some of the more complicated services, um, but there's basically, we're at pretty low coverage for tests right now. Okay. All right, yeah. I know that's not the answer you want to hear, but that is the state of things. Um, okay. So I'm gonna be adding a, um, this aware, an aware of modules parameter to the data model so that each module has a list of other modules that it's aware of. Um, basically, the change to do that is as you go into this data model, there's a property called has many which is what Grails uses to set up one-to-many relationships. Um, and I can just go in here and type aware of modules, and we're gonna store it as a string for now. Um, we're just gonna be passing the IDs as strings. So 
That is the only change that needs to be made to the data model. Um, and then we can jump back into that release controller. Um, now access the aware of modules property. Um, and I'm just gonna do the same thing that required modules does where if for if the user specified uh, their own like list of requirements, we'll include that, but otherwise we're gonna use the one that's been returned from the OMOD parser. So those are the three code changes that we need to make to Modulus itself. Um, and then what I'll walk through in addition is, and let me just exit the version of Grails that's already running, um, is generating the uh, database change set. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and run a Grails compile just to make sure that everything looks good and then I didn't make any typos as I was putting that in. To, to um, remind myself, Grails yes. uses Hibernate and Spring under the hood, right? Yep. It, uses, it, it So ultimately below this is, I mean, it creates Hibernate mappings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's sitting on top of Spring and Hibernate um, and it can be a little bit opaque at times, especially because it's trying to do things dynamically. Um, but in general, you can drop down to the Spring and Hibernate level, level if you need to. All right. So the Grails uh, database migration plugin is all documented on the methods for it, but basically the command I'm gonna run here is gonna look at the, the uh, model that's specified in our code and then look at the state the database is in and produce a delta of changes that have to be made. Um, and so I'm just gonna name it off of the branch that we have right now. And then this add argument at the end well, basically, there's a there's a single file that contains all of the individual change sets, um, and this is just going to append it to that list. So I'll go ahead and generate that. Um, and on my computer, Grails is a weird thing where it overwrites the last line on the terminal, which is very annoying. Um, but it'll take a few seconds to generate that, and then I'll show you what the change set looks like as soon as it's done. The, the warning that you see right here um, isn't a problem. Essentially, the, the reason it's there is because this plugin, um, this may have changed now and I should look back into it, but at the time of development, there was a slight modification that we had to make for it to work with us uh, because of a kind of disagreement in the design of the plugin between me and the guy who wrote it. Um, and so we have a local copy of it. So Grails picks it up at runtime, but when it's checking for its plugin dependencies, it complains that this one isn't installed. Uh, but it's in a like lib directory at the root. So what this script does is it essentially starts up the whole Grails application. And that's why you see these kind of boot up messages and then runs a migration script immediately once it starts. Okay. Actually, I'll just do it here. So I'll go ahead and show you what that migration looks like. Um, if we jump in here, you see these like four different change sets. Um, these all are, you can see there's a create table called module aware of modules, which is that mapping between the string of module awareness and the module ID. Um, then there is a column down here that's added for module ID and then a foreign key constraint since the module ID is being referenced in these two tables. Um, one thing that's just kind of an existing bug is, or it's not a bug, but it's um, unnecessary is 
there may have been a change in the data, the data model at some point that changed this not null constraint on passwords. And so every time I've been generating it, it has this drop not null constraint. I'm going to delete that for now since it has nothing to do with the change that we made. But I'll take a look at that uh, as I'm going through and kind of cleaning things up this week. Um, but anyway, that's what the change log would look like. And then the auto generated index name there. Yes. Wait. What do you mean when you say that? Sorry, the second change set has an index name of blah, 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 FK1BB. Mm -hmm. And the, your convention, the convention has just been, we, we leave these auto-generated IDs. That's fine. Yeah, the convention has just been that so far. Um, the convention is sort of, there's not much of a convention there. Um, but we've just been using what's auto-generated. OK. I mean, that sounds fine. OK, yeah. It might be something to look at uh, in the future. Yeah, uh, just curious, are we using uh, Spring Security and Spring Security OAuth plugins uh, to handle the entire authentication process? Yeah, um, let me show you really quick what, uh, what Spring Security plugins we're using. But essentially, this is the build config for Grails where it has all of the plugins needed. Um, but yeah, Spring Security is being used um, and then Spring Security OAuth is sitting on top of that, which is what's configuring authentication with OpenMRS ID. Um, but then Spring Security and the, uh, let me jump over to the release controller because you'll be able to see it. Um, the secured annotation is being used. Um, so what Spring Security gives us is we have a user role and an admin role. And so there are methods that are protected to only be able to be performed by authenticated users or by admins. Um, and then in addition to that, there are some API methods like, um, like an update method, like the update method where some users can make an update. Users who are the maintainer of that module can make an update um, and admins can make an update. So there's a method here called unauthorized, which calls this has permissions method, basically looks at the current user as identified by Spring Security, um, and then checks on the data model if they have edit rights to that module. And so that check is performed on any API methods where the, the user who's performing the operation has to either be an admin or a maintainer of a particular module. Uh, so how do we make a user an admin? Like, do we have an API method for that? There's not an API method for that. It's controlled by OpenMRS ID. And when I said there's a little bit too tight of a coupling between OpenMRS ID and Modulus, this is one of those areas. Um, so that will also, that'll be something when I talked about at the beginning of, I'll be showing a, um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to change the way that authentication works on development environment so that you can make a, you can load like pre made profiles. You could, essentially like with a click just become an admin um that'll be one of the things that changes but in production it the admins are roles that are controlled by um the open id server are those um i would assume that open id server has some idea of groups or, or roles generally but is there yes. nothing within this application that says a certain role name or group name on OpenMRS ID corresponds to what we consider admin here? I think that's how it works. I would have to go and, and check that. Um, if that's not the way it works, then there's at the very least a ticket for it. Um, because in most cases on different infrastructure applications, that's exactly how admin membership works is it's a group membership property. OK. Um, okay, so but I've got a, I've got a quick question about that. Uh huh. Yeah, but um, is there a difference between being an owner of a module and being the, an admin? Because I suppose if you're an owner of a module, you would want certain rights to manipulate that particular module without being particular. I mean, an admin as well in general. 
Yeah, if I if I understand you correctly, um, an owner of a module or a maintainer of a module is like a local admin on that module. They can perform any of the actions that an admin could on their own module. An admin is a system level role. So an admin has uh, deletion and editing permissions on any module in the system. Okay, so what you're saying is um, this, I mean, open MRS ID actually allows um, people to be designated as um, module admins. I mean, I yeah, know. I think what he's saying is that the open MRS ID would allow you to be allow someone to be like a globally an administrator mm -hmm. of modulus completely. And probably it also lets it also ensures you know, that you have a particular username and probably in just the set directly in the management pages for one module is where it would check. Are you in the list of owners of that module or something? Exactly. Like well, um, OpenMS ID doesn't have the list of owners. That's just yeah. part of modulus. Yep. Um, I'll show you in production, for example. Um, there's a list of maintainers here. These are all usernames that correspond with users in OpenMS ID. Um, and they've been designated as people who have edit rights to XForms. Um, and this is a relationship that's maintained within Modulus entirely. The way that it works is when you upload a module, the account that you're signed in as becomes its first maintainer. And then you can go and add or remove other maintainers. So the only thing that OpenMRS ID influences is if you have that admin bit that makes you the super administrator over everything. OK, thank you. I now understand. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so I'm going to, I had that changelog file. I'm just going to persist it to the database now and actually make the changes. Um, while that's going on, I'll go ahead and show what we added to the UI, um, which yeah, in this so case is. Is that command, well, that's a standard Grails command. So yep. presumably it's not documented in the modulus readme. But... It's, yeah, um, but it's. It's documented in the Grails uh, database migration tool, and I can link, I can link to that documentation as well, um, from within the README of just like here's what you need to do. I think there's somewhere where I've listed like here's what a typical um, workflow of making a database migration looks like, um, but I'll double check on that. Yeah, I mean it's fine. We can we can Google. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but ultimately it's a it's a um, command within Grails. Okay, um, so I'm going to jump over to the UI. The two things where we're adding this property in the UI is showing it in the upload form, similar to required modules, and then showing it as a row in the view page. So I'm going to go ahead and start in the view page, uh, because that's what I have open. You can see, as we're coming through here, um, there's a table that's specifying all of the data in this table. Um, and if you've not worked with Angular before, the, uh, the double braces are parameters in the Angular template. So this is actually pulling things from the, the um, view model that Angular is getting by talking to the modulus server. So there's a row here that's required modules, um, and basically it's just a span of module names. And so we're going to add something similar to that. That will look like this. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, Let me just go ahead and strip out those pluses. And then formatting a little bit. Um, OK, that is actually 
the wrong thing. This is what I was looking for. Okay. What this is, there's an aware of modules. Um, this span here is just a tooltip that describes a little bit of what the aware of modules property is like. Um, and then in this span, you have a loop in the aware of modules property being exposed by the API, and then the module name and a comma if it's not the last one. So go ahead and save that, and then jump over to create module.html which is uh, the upload page. Over here, I'm gonna add a similar thing. Um, just another entry in the form. Um, and the same thing, it's going to have an input that's just bound to this aware of modules property coming from the API. So when you upload a module, you get, and let me sign in real quick um, to show you what it looks like in prod. When you upload a module, as soon as you the OMOD finishes uploading and is parsed, all of these fields get pre-populated. So this aware of modules one is just gonna be one that's pre-populated from the parser. Um, and there's actually, there's a read-only property on it because what we're doing right now is just parsing the OMOD. Uh, there's been some discussion in JIRA about allowing people to manually specify these kinds of dependencies. Uh, but for right now, we're just reading off of the OMOD config.xml. So I'm going to go ahead and save changes to those. And then these are the only two changes that need to be made to um, the, the back end. What's been running in the back here is a grunt command. It's called grunt serve, um, which for the UI is always watching for changes to the to JS, CSS, or HTML files. Um, and we'll always build and redeploy and actually live reload a page in your development environment. Um, all right, so let me go back to core uh, and restart the server. That's just a command called grails run app. And I can show you these changes. Um, while that's going, let me jump over to the database here. Um, there's a property that the, the grails database migration plugin contains. Um, which is uh, basically it's a change log and it keeps track of all of the changes that were made. So you can see right here, we have those three change sets from that uh, January 27th demo file. Um, and what you can also see is in the module table, there is actually the module table is unchanged, but there's this module required modules table that facilitates this um, mapping between a module and then a string that it requires. And then there's also, this is the one that was generated, the aware of modules table, which maintains a similar relationship. Okay, um, while Grail start, is starting up, any questions so far? Actually, I got a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with this module rep repository, how is it ad administered? Is that administrator or is it administered by the help and desk? I mean, um, 
I mean, in case something needs to be changed, I mean. Yes. Um, so the infrastructure team and the help desk are the one, are the people who are keeping this running in production. Um, so the same way that any sort of like community application like the wiki or Jira or talk is administered, um, those same people are in charge of making sure that Modulus stays online. Um, and so that's something where as a, as a developer for Modulus, you're not really responsible for the deployment. That's what people on the infrastructure team are doing um, and keeping, keeping it operationally working. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thanks. OK. All right. Now that the core server started back up, let me jump through authorization again. And here we go. We can go ahead and upload. You can see we made that aware of modules. We added that field to the upload, and it's there now. And that tooltip is also there describing what this property means. So now I'm just going to drag in the Xforms OMOD and get it uploaded. And you can see it populated the data that it could. Um, and one of the things it has here is the IDs of the modules that it's aware of. So it looks like everything is working on the back end. <laughs> um, we'll go ahead and hit complete upload. Um, you'll see that it made me the maintainer. So like I was talking about how when a module is uploaded, the user uploading it becomes a maintainer. Uh, it's automatically set me as a maintainer here. Um, and then you can see this field with the where of modules where we're pulling all those in from the API and displaying them in line in this table. Let me go ahead since we've got a couple more minutes and just show you what the API call looks like for that. Um, so you can start to play with the REST API. The REST API is something that I've documented and I'll link to that documentation. It's already linked in the repository, um, but all of the API resources are described and there's a little bit about how to do the authentication handshake with OAuth as well. Um, let's see here. Let me reload the page so that Chrome will uh, record all of the network activity. OK, so the key one that you see here is um, nine, and that's because the, the resource it's hitting is uh, localhost 8080, which is the modulus core server on my computer, slash API, slash module, slash, slash nine. And nine is the unique number for this module within our system. Um, that was just an options request. Here's the actual one. So that's all that's sent. It's a git. Uh, there's a JSON that comes back. And here's the JSON um, prettified and put into a tree. You can see all these properties are coming back on this module, like its description, timestamps for when it was created and updated, a list of maintainers, which is actually a list corresponding to user objects. Um, so. This user ID one named Elliot Williams, username Elliot, is the only user in my dev instance right now. Um, has a name. It has a list of releases, which are all IDs for release objects. And those releases are what are queried to produce this table. Um, and then it has this aware of modules entry that we just made, which like we defined in a data model is a list of strings. And so there are the four strings that are being used to construct properties up here. Um, the other, only other thing of note is you can see the query that's made to produce this list of releases. Uh, the reason those are separated is because there are some instances where you want to load a module and you don't want to get all the release data. So there are two separate requests that are made to produce this page. Um, but what this one looks like is it's you give it a module, and then there's a, a resource on that module called releases. Um, and then we have some parameters of how to sort it basically by version in a descending order. Um, and since there's one release, we're getting that object. It has a URL that you can hit to download the OMOD from the server, very important. Um, and then just some other metadata about its relationship to the module and its version number, things like that. 
Um, all right, so that does it for my demo, which has lined up quite well with the hour. Um, but before we go, any questions, anything that you would like to know from me or anything that you'd like me to do as I like I'm trying to make Modulus a little bit more developer friendly. Um, the things that I have in mind right now that I'd like to do by the end of the week are changing authorization so you can kind of short circuit the OAuth process if you're a developer and you don't have to have access to OpenMRS ID um, and link to some of the documentation that we talked about here. But any questions yeah. from you guys? Offhand, yeah. you know. So yeah. offhand, yeah. you know, different versions of Grails. But do you know if newer versions of Rails don't work? I'm just sort of running through the instructions now, and it says install 2.3.7. I'm wondering if installing the latest is good enough. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Um, since I last kind of stopped working on this regularly, uh, Grails has moved to a 3.x, and so my guess is there are probably going to be small changes that have to be made, but nothing huge. Um, so what might be worth my time or someone else's time since it's been about a year since any changes were made to this repository is to just do a big dependency update and see if we can get things running on latest. Um, but 2.3.7 is what's used in production right now. Okay. Yeah, I've got a question. Does the continuous build on Bamboo push to um, this server? Sort of. Uh, so the continuous build on Bamboo produces WAR files uh, for the, the server. And they aren't pushed anywhere automatically, um, but it produces them. And then there's kind of a one-click deploy button that updates those deployments in production. No, I mean, if, um, if you build a module on um, Bamboo, like you build... Oh. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Would it ultimately mm. push it to the module repository, or that's a manual step? As far as I know, that's still manual. Um, Cynthia was looking at that also about a year ago, and there was some... Because I, I know there was some interest on adding a step into the bamboo process to so just automatically, especially push updates. Since for an update, you don't really need to specify any metadata. You just need to include the new OMOD. As far as I know, there's nothing that does that right now. Um, but that's something, part of the, the inspiration to set up the core and the UI of Modulus separately is so that we have an API that we could potentially write a script that would push that update. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, anything else before we go? Um, nothing else from my end. That's really, this is really helpful, Elliot. Um, I think hopefully between <laughs> those of us who watch this, we'll be able to catalyze a bit more further development, especially like little bug fixes on on modulus um because there's lots of tiny little things that are annoying and mm -hmm. i'm sure we could fix but no one ever does yeah uh, yeah and so it'll be great to start moving on those things um i guess maybe uh, you so as you you said modulus is already built in ci so actually deploying a new version to production is technically easy if if you're someone who has like right or an account in CI. But I guess we need a proper process for that now. Yeah, it'd probably be well, we'll need a proper process. Um and it's a little bit different because if I'm not the one who's primarily making changes and then since I'm a member of infrastructure, the deployment pr process for me has usually been like sending an IRC message on the infra channel and saying, okay, I'm about to deploy this, is that all right? And then I get the go ahead and then I push the button myself. Um, and so we probably need a more formalized process of how someone else can uh, request a new deployment and that deployment can be made. Yep, and without without a big test suite, this unfortunately 
we're going to have to just hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we have a staging server. And so there's a little bit of manual testing that can be done. Um, and Bamboo can push to that server as well. Uh, but you're right, especially since Grails is dynamic enough that it's very, very easy to get runtime errors. Um, I think that's sort of, as, as this goes further, a big kind of gaping hole and like things that need to be done. Um, so I'll go ahead, add, I'm going to go ahead and then my notes for things to follow up on is just to start looking at test suites and maybe figuring out what's going to be the best way to go forward. Grails has uh, unit testing built into it. And so hopefully we can just extend some basic test, test classes and especially start hitting things like the data model and the service layer and making sure that they're behaving properly. All right, um, unless there's anything else that I've missed, I think that's everything from my end. Uh, thanks everyone for coming and listening to me talk through this for an hour. Um, I will go ahead and follow up and try to get this video posted that I uh, recorded. And other than that, I think that about does it. So yeah, thanks so much for coming and uh, definitely let me know on IRC or via OpenMRS Talk if you have any interest in doing some more development on Modulus. And especially right now, I can help you get started uh, if the documentation or if anything else isn't quite there yet. Sure. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, Elliot. This has been very useful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elliot. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. Uh, so I'll be signing off, but see you all in cyberspace. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Bye.